but can you hear me okay? Well, I want to thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, we have an exceptional group of folks from across the media landscape here in Philadelphia. Uh, I want to first and foremost thank our host at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Bill Marimo, who is here, as also Stan Wojowski. Thank you so much for letting us use your beautiful room. Thank you so much. If we can have a hand for our host. I also want to thank uh, Nia Meeks for her work setting this up and uh, handling all logistics. Thank you, Nia. And before we get started, uh, I wanted to at least give a moment to uh, a few of our partners. We also have a great relationship with the uh, PABJ, and so I want to quickly welcome Sarah Glover, uh, the president, to say a word or two. Sarah? I'll say a brief uh, few words, and that's welcome. I know this evening will be engaging and productive, and it's great to see so many different media outlets represented this evening, and we look forward to your participation, and thank you for our panelists who traveled from afar to be with us this evening. Have a great night. Also, of course, want to welcome uh, Mike Days, Managing Editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, to say a few words. Mike? Just wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of the Inquirer and Philadelphia Media Network. We're happy you're here. We know you are very busy people. But when the Maiden Institute said to us six months ago, would you please consider partnering with us to begin looking at content, be look, to begin looking at ways that we can write about, talk about men of color, African-American men in ways that are not so obvious, in ways that, that talk about them in the, in the totality of who they are, we said absolutely. So thank you again for being here. I think it'll be a wonderful two hours. Take care. Thank you very much. So. Uh, I'm going to give those, we've had one of these meetings before, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background, sort of set the stage for the evening, uh, give a little distillation of what those meetings were like, then introduce our two speakers, have them speak a little bit about uh, how it, media images impact uh, and covering ethnic communities, and then what we'll do, very important work, is to uh, have some breakout groups where you'll have some conversations. We have a few conveners here, so you have group numbers, but we'll get to that uh, shortly, and then we'll have a little brief reporting out session so that we can take what we get from all of you tonight and utilize that to inform uh, future discussions. So first, my name is Martin Reynolds and I'm senior editor for community engagement for the Bay Area News Group, but in this capacity, I'm the co-founder of the Voices Project, which was started at the Oakland Tribune back in 2010 in partnership with the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. And tonight, uh, this event is brought to you by the Maynard Institute, which is a national nonprofit based in Oakland, which endeavors to have newsrooms across America better reflect the communities in which they cover. Dory Maynard, the president, is back there tonight and will be one of uh, your moderators as well. This event is also, and these series of conversations is funded by a grant from the Open Societies Foundation's Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And so we want to thank Soros for their generous support to hold these conversations. Voices was created in Oakland, it was called Oakland Voices at the time, because there was a disconnect with us at the Oakland Tribune and the communities we were covering, particularly West and East Oakland. Uh, the dialogue between the communities had been frayed over time. Uh, there wasn't the kind of relationships necessary to, to cover the communities in a way where they felt they were accurately portrayed. As journalists, we thought we were doing a good job, but in talking with the community, there was the sense that we were missing things. There was certain elements that were not coming through in our coverage. And so, Oakland Voices was born from that, where we train residents to become storytellers, and then their content appears in the newspaper and on our websites. And it ended up being a very powerful relationship where we learned from them and they learned from us. And I think what was most important in the Voices situation was that there was a relationship that was built and the content that they produced helped to reframe the narrative of these communities that were generally overrepresented in stories about crime and violence. And it was after about 2010 where we thought perhaps that 
we could take Oakland Voices and migrate it to other communities. The program training portion was run by the Maynard Institute, which also served as the fiscal sponsor. And then we said, we approached, as Mike pointed out, Mike Days to ask him, you know, is this something that we may be able to bring to Philadelphia? He was very open to it. And so we pursued seeking funds. And we also got funding from Soros to have a Jackson Voices. So there's a Jackson Voices in Jackson, Mississippi and a partnership there with the Clarion Ledger, where 10 residents have been trained, and they're now telling stories about Jackson and focusing on black men and reframing that narrative around uh, the black community and black men in Jackson. Our program in Philadelphia is a little bit different in that it's a series of conversations intended to bring journalists uh, together with the community to discuss a framework for how a lasting change to the narrative can be done to refocus that around black men in this city. So the first meeting we had was in November of 2007 in this very room, and it was done with the intent, really we needed to get folks from the community to talk a little bit about what they thought the outcomes needed to be, what the issues were, and some of those folks are in this room today. And we needed a better understanding of the issues, the players, the outcomes, and what we'd hoped to achieve over this series of conversations. And what happened was it yielded five particular areas that those in attendance felt we needed to focus on. The first being an infrastructure, that there needed to be a framework to maintain consistent coverage that better reflects the totality of African American men's experience and contributions. Some suggested perhaps a CNN kind of I report digital platform that for feeding stories and perspectives. Uh, there were other thoughts that perhaps Comcast's uh, Internet Essentials program, which brings uh, the internet and digital tools to communities at a much at a discounted rate, could perhaps perhaps be used. And now we're hearing about the Be Me project that's funded by Knight that is actually funding specific initiatives in the community. These are all infrastructure pieces that could be tapped into. The other was stories and access, that there needed to be a mechanism by which people and or organizations can connect uh, with stories about African American men, um, and that perhaps standing features could be devised that would run in the inky or multiple platforms. Um, one example was used was a hometown heroes uh, that was actually a partnership that's going on in Com with Comcast in the Bay Area where there are stories, print stories that are done and then Comcast does a broadcast version and then there's a banquet at the end of the year. Very powerful uh, series and event that connects people doing great work in the community. Perhaps that is a model that could be uh, replicated here. The other was there is a need to focus on newsroom leadership, that uh, there needs to be leadership in place that's willing, able, uh, and open to assign and run stories that go beyond existing narratives around African American men and boys, which is why we thought that that first conversation really should center around folks as yourselves who are leaders in the, in the media community. The other two areas were network, that there needs to be a group of key advocates and liaisons that should be developed to maintain contact with key news outlets to pitch stories and monitor ongoing coverage. This must be a diverse and influential group, and I think the words that folks use was pillars of the community kind of people needed to be included in that mix. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, were that there needed to be relationships, developing specific relationships between the community and community-based organizations and news outlets and the people within them, the reporters, the editors, and that there must be trust that is developed so that this can continue on. So based on the distillation of these working groups in November, there was a clear understanding of need, right? And there was a clear understanding of what folks hoped the outcomes would be. But going forward, we needed to figure out how to get there. It's that gap in between that these conversations are intended to inform. And so with that, one of those key components is, is information and is framing, and it's getting a sense of how the images that we put forth as journalists impact the community. So with that, we have two very esteemed speakers tonight. 
to my left, and I'm really excited that they would take the time out of their incredibly busy schedules to be here. On my far left, and who will begin first, is Professor Andrew Rojeki. He is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His research interest in political communication, focusing on interaction between the mass media and political movements, racial politics, and public opinion. His book, Silence the Opposition, is an analysis of the interaction of the anti-nuclear movements, the press, and political elites during the Cold War. And for purposes of this conversation, he is also co-author of The Black Image in the White Mind, a study of racial attitudes and their relationship to mass media content. The book won the Goldsmith Book Prize awarded by the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, the American Political Science Association, and a host of other awards. So with that, please welcome Professor Rojeki. Thank you. I'm gonna introduce Arlene, but then we'll have you start, okay? Uh, also, we have Arlene Morgan here, who is Associate Dean of Prizes and Programs at Columbia University. Ms. Morgan oversees the administration of the school's many prestigious prizes and professional development workshops. And in addition, she directs the annual Let's Do It Better workshop on journalism, race, and ethnicity. She is co-author, excuse me, co-editor of The Authentic Voice, The Best Reporting on Race and Ethnicity, a compilation, textbook, DVD, and website from award-winning stories from her program. Morgan joined the Columbia staff in 2000 after a 31-year career here at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where she served as an assistant managing editor for readership, hiring, and staff development. In 1995, Morgan was honored with the first Knight Ritter Excellence in Diversity Award for her work to diversify the Inquirer's staff and for leadership in this area. Please welcome Ms. Arlene Morgan. So let's dive into it. Do we have... Uh, we need to address your, uh, the projector there. Do we have, uh, let's see. It needs to be showing something different. Is that working? Okay, so we just need to, we need to push a button someplace to get the thing to recognize the computer, so. <clears throat> That should do it. Okay, well, the computer is syncing up with the display device. Uh, I'd like to say hello, and I'm uh, really honored to be here. Uh, it's the first time I'm actually speaking before a group of media professionals. Um, uh, I speak mainly to academic audiences, and uh, largely to my students, and I talk about your work. So. Uh, this is really interesting for me to have the opportunity to actually get engaged in talking about the effects of your work, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, so my talk today, uh, I'll use the Trayvon Martin case, which is probably the most salient case, I think, recently, to talk about uh, how citizens think about race and how their thoughts affect the life chances of African Americans and of the importance, obviously, of the mass media in this process. And so this is a little um, preview of what I'll be talking about. And I'll argue that although black prosperity has increased, uh, that alone has not reduced the role played by race uh, in the lives of African Americans. Uh, this is due in some part to the very different ways that blacks and whites experience the world. Uh, for whites, the civil rights movement uh, has made this a colorblind world. Uh, for whites, the movement changed laws that made it possible for blacks to achieve equality. Uh, it also changed social norms. It changed the way that people spoke about race. Um, these two changes, I think, have driven bias underground. At least that's the main takeaway from the research that I've done and that I've read about. For blacks, this still remains a color-conscious world uh, where bias may be more subtle, um, but it's still common and it continues to reduce life chances. Um, 
largely through continuous segregation, which is both the cause and effect of contemporary bias. And this is, of course, why this is where the media come into play, because whites do depend in some part on the media for their images of blacks. But the media environment has also changed. So I'll conclude my talk by talking about the new information environment and how this affects everything. So a few weeks ago, uh, as I read some reports on the Trayvon Martin case, um, I came across a really remarkable article in the Washington Post. Uh, and the title of the article tells us something about the gap between our nation's ideals and its achievements. And the title of the, of the story was How the Martin Case Became the Martin Story. So my understanding is that a case is just an event, an occurrence that may or may not come to public attention. By contrast, and of course, you know this, the story has a social component because it is an account of an event told to others. And a story tells us what happened and why. It engages us in an issue that affects us as a society. So stories teach us lessons, reveal moral truths, and call attention to public responsibilities. Anyway, so as I read the story, I was reminded of Martin Luther King's strategy um, for the Birmingham campaign. Uh, his intent was, as he put it, to dramatize the gulf between promise and fulfillment, as he said, to make the invisible visible. And this excerpt is from his memoir, um, where he recounted a strategy for making a story for the Northern press, essentially exposing what was going on in the South to an audience that really didn't know all that much about it, wasn't all that intimately acquainted with it. King's words reminded me that the Martin homicide would have remained a mere occurrence and not even a legal case because the Sanford Police Department did not choose to investigate it, did not arrest and charge the shooter. It took over six weeks before a special prosecutor brought charges against Zimmerman. But it was not the merits of the case that got public officials involved. According to the Post story, it was Trayvon Martin's parents who fought to get media attention. And that would put pressure on the political system to respond in some way. Had this been the civil rights era, um, the parents likely would have enlisted someone with the stature of King to stir public interest. In this case, they hired a public relations expert a strategy that reminds us, I think, of how important the media remain for the cause of social justice. I'll read a few paragraphs from the story in the Post, uh, just the first two paragraphs. It's likely that, that Martin's death, which resulted in the unrest and indictment Wednesday of confessed shooter George Zimmerman, would never have crowded into the national consciousness had it not been for Martin's parents, its lawyers, and an enterprising PR man. And this is the other paragraph. Outraged by the lack of an arrest, the Martin Camp lobbied news outlets to examine what had happened that night in Sanford. Eventually, the media did, and that story moved like a fast-burning fuse, leaping from traditional news sources to the blogosphere and social media. I think that the Martin case illustrates what I tell my students and what social scientists call the principal implementation gap. Martin's family represents the growth of the black middle class, but also the bias it continues to face in ways that are more difficult to see by the white population. The primary reason for the invisibility is segregation and the nature of the way that bias is expressed today. So these are some maps, some excellent maps that were drawn, that were developed at Yale that kind of illustrate the point about this, how this is still largely a segregated data, uh, society. Now, this, these data from, are, are from 2000, um, but those little dots represent groups of people. Um, the red dots represent whites. Blue, the blue dots represent blacks, the green Asians, and the orange Hispanics. So as you can see, I come from Chicago. And as you know, if you've been to Chicago, you, you cross the street, you go from a white neighborhood to a black neighborhood. It's largely because the city's laid out in a grid and it's fairly easy to segregate that way. But it's also true in other, in other large cities, including Detroit. You can see that in Atlanta, it's, it's slightly more dispersed. 
here in Philadelphia, also high, high indices of segregation, New York City. San Francisco is one of the least segregated cities, but you can still see the concentrations there. A recent review of the research in segregation um, concludes that segregation shows few signs of abating, that the negative consequences appear to be uh, decreasing, um, but that for blacks, race trumps class. And political scientists have come up with a name for this, and they call this black class ex exceptionalism. So in recent years, income inequality has emerged among the black population, which echoes a trend found among whites. The proportion of blacks in the middle class has more than doubled since the end of World War II, and especially since the Civil Rights Movement. Of course, Trayvon Martin's case represents that in some respect. At the same time, the, the poor population among blacks has also doubled. Now, ordinarily, one would expect economic success to bring changes in political preferences. So the wealthier you were, the wealthier you are, the more conservative you are. But that's not the case for the black population. Instead, as black prosperity has increased, black cohesion has increased. Blacks have become more liberal and more pro-black. The reasons for this is because middle-class blacks often work or live in predominantly white environments where they are subject to racial misperceptions and hostility more regularly than other blacks. For these successful blacks, glass ceilings, small slights, and more blatant acts of prejudice all lead to frustration and anger. Above all, these reinforce rather than lessen racial consciousness. And this is also true among younger blacks, and then this implies a, condition, a continued role for race for the near term. So now I'll talk a little bit about the modern forms of bias, and um, it's helpful to sort of make a few analytical distinctions call this the ABCs of bias, affect or feeling, this is the negative feelings that someone may, may harbor, that's prejudice, behavior, actually acting on your feelings, that's discrimination, and cognition, what people believe to be true, or holding negative stereotypes. Now, I think the simplest way to explain racial bias today is that much of it has gone underground. And I mean this in two senses. First, whites may be unaware that they are prejudiced and that they actually hold stereotypes to be true. And secondly, that bias is expressed more covertly today than it's ever been before. So by wide majorities, whites have accepted the principles of equality. In other words, public norms have changed. It's no longer, it's no longer acceptable to express bias publicly Yet bias is still very much in evidence as measured in the lab and in real life. Most social scientists agree on its continued presence. The controversy centers on a degree to which this bias is conscious and deliberate. Deliberate bias is difficult to overcome, but unconscious bias, something that's called implicit attitudes, can be overcome, especially because of broad support for these principles of equality. So I teach a course on race, media, and politics, and one of the challenges that I have is to overcome racial fatigue among my students. In other words, students are both tired of talking about race and they're also fearful of talking about it. They've grown up with what they regard as a politically correct environment. The idea they must be careful not to offend minorities, even if they feel that they themselves are free of any sort of negative feelings. They're just afraid to talk about it and tired of talking about it. This is why one of the first things that I asked them to do was to take uh, the, a test called Project Implicit at Harvard University. And you can take this. It's, you can just Google this and look this up, and it's, it's really interesting. The premise of the test is that stereotypical associations take less time than counter-stereotypical associations. For example, that it takes a longer period of time for prejudiced whites to associate good words like love, 
peace, wonderful pleasure, and so on, with black images than with white images. Many of my white students, and even some of my black students, are surprised and disappointed when they learn that they have an unconscious preference for whites. These are implicit attitudes. Now, this may seem trivial. In other words, just knowing something doesn't necessarily mean that you act on it. But it turns out that this has serious real-world consequences. Some are immediate and deadly. Others are more long-term and subtle, but debilitating. The immediate example, one that I think played a part in the Martin case, is what's called shooter bias. Now, there are psychologists who have developed a video game. This, you, can, you can play this video game. It's available from the Stereotype and Prejudice Lab at the University of Chicago, also available on the web. Um, so there's a video game that shows a white or black man holding guns or other objects, such as wallets, soft drinks, or cell phones, in realistic backgrounds. And you, as a participant, are asked to decide as soon as possible whether to shoot or not shoot. Okay? So in one version of this study, studies came, stu subjects came to the correct decision more quickly to shoot armed targets when the target was black. So in other words, when they saw a black um, actor holding a gun, they were, more qu they were more quickly shot. In other words, they pressed a key that shot the uh, um, target. Subjects also came more quickly to the, to the correct decision not to shoot unarmed targets when the target was white. In another version of this uh, study, the, the, re the researchers reduced the amount of time available to respond. Here, subjects are more likely to shoot a black target even when no gun is present. Conversely, they're less likely to shoot a white target when a gun wa was present. So when you think about real-world applications of this, I'm reminded of Amadou Diallo, the young West African immigrant, uh, who stood in the doorway to his apartment and he was shot 41 times by New York police who saw a gun that was not present. And of course, the, the Martin case also comes to mind. When it comes to life chances, real-world experiments reveal the more subtle kinds of discrimination faced by blacks. So in one study, two economists at the University of Chicago sent resumes in response to help wanted ads in Boston and Chicago. The resumes were identical in all respects, except for, except for the names that were used. The questions asked by the researchers was whether Jamal and Lakeisha were as likely as Emily and Greg to get job interviews. And you know, I have to take a minute. I, I, gave the study for my students to read, and one of my Mexican students told me that that was precisely why her parents decided to call her Emily rather than Amelia, because they understood that this took place. So if you, if you had a stereotypically white name, you're 50% more likely to get callbacks. This study was done in 2004. This study is even more remarkable. This is where people actually went to interviews to see if they could get hired. So sociologists from Princeton sent teams, matching teams of young men for over 1,400 entry-level jobs in New York City. The applicants were well-spoken young men in their early to mid-20s, most college-educated. All were trained to ensure they presented themselves in the same attractive way. In some cases, white applicants admitted that they had a felony conviction. So here, here's a chart that sort of describes the data. And this is just a summary of what the authors found. We find that black job applicants are only two-thirds as successful as equally qualified Latinos, and a little more than half as successful as equally qualified whites. And that, of course, supports the study that I just talked about, the resume experiment. And I say, indeed, black job seekers were fare no better than white men just released from prison. So we now turn to the role played by the media. Racial attitudes depend on the kinds of stories provided through the media or narrated by parents and, and peers. So what do these images tell us? I'm going to focus mainly on the news. 
crime contributes to a heavy share of broadcast news programming. This is true for national news, but especially for local news. According to the Columbia Journalism Review, uh, news is the most widely used source of information about crime. About six in 10 Americans get their news from nightly newscasts. And a number of studies show that newscasts spend about a quarter of the time on crime stories, and that crime stories tend to lead the broadcast half the time. Black focus stories are two and a half times more likely to be about crime than white focus stories. Whites represent approximately 43% of the homicide victims featured in crime news, but represent only 13% of homicide victims, according to crime reports. In other words, whites are three times more likely to be represented as victims than blacks. This overrepresentation has been found in network news programs and in multiple news markets. What makes this important is that these reports build and reinforce the implicit attitudes that lead to the shooter bias and the subtle forms of discrimination that I mentioned earlier. The takeaway is that implicit attitudes lead to support for more punitive measures such as the war on drugs, tougher parole policies, and a three strikes policy. And these costs impose very heavy burden on blacks and larger society. This is just a, an, an amazing study that was done by Pew just a few years ago. Uh, it found that the prison population tripled between 1987 and 2007. One in 100 Americans behind bars. And that while one in 30 men between the ages of 20 and 34 is behind bars, for black males in that age group, that figure is one in nine. Meanwhile, the costs borne by society are very high. More than, sorry, uh, very high. So the, the costs of imprisoning this population have, have doubled in the last 20 years, from $19 billion annually in 1987 uh, to $44 billion in 2007. And just for comparison purposes, the amount spent on higher education during the same period increased by only 21%. I'll talk a little bit about the new media environment and what we can expect to happen given the changes in the, uh, in the information environment. Now, as you well know, being media professionals, that the audience for news has shrunk despite the growth of media sources. Another way of putting this is that there is a reduced accidental audience for news, at least when it comes to television, because you could just turn the TV on, and with, with, with a few channels, you were, you were more, more than likely to sort of bump into the news, even if you didn't intend to watch it. Today, people have a lot more choices, and so they're less likely to seek the news. On the other hand, among those who do seek the news, traditional media sources are still regarded as more credible by the public. And as we saw in the Martin case, social media can sometimes drive traditional media content. But we also need to be more realistic about this changed information environment. A certain proportion of a, po a, certain portion of a population will seek information that reinforces what they already believe. This leads to increased partisanship. People who are more racist may be motivated to seek out non-traditional internet sources of information and rumor. This may in turn reinforce racial animosity. I'm involved currently in a study of the information, informa of the informal information channels uh, that are passed along people in email networks. This was a primary driver of what was called the birther movement. Um, and what people call dog whistles. In other words, words that trigger implicit associations, like the food staff president. 
Whether this will prove significant depends on the origins of, of, implus, of implicit bias. Unlike some social scientists, I am cautiously optimistic in this respect. Again, uh, because of the changed nature of the information environment. Now, it's too early to draw any conclusions on the effects of this environment, but my hypothesis is that African Americans have become less reliant on traditional sources of movement mobilization, such as charismatic leaders, the church, and mass demonstrations. I think the internet offers self-empowerment uh, that's much more likely to take place. That's certainly what happened in the Trayvon Martin case. The social media made the media color conscious, leading the media to cover the story, and that put pressure on legal authorities to do their job. There are other examples that offer hopeful cues. In 1988, the Bush campaign ran what was called the Willie Horton ad, which played on whites' implicit attitudes. That, came, that campaign was very effective until Jesse Jackson pointed out its blatant racist appeal. In other words, he actually said something about it, and this caused whites to say, oh, now I see this. More recently, the Martin case influenced the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, an interest group that helps frame legislation to retreat from stand your ground laws, the kind that led to Trayvon Martin's death. It also retreated from sponsoring ID laws that threatened to reduce minority turnout at the polling booth. We don't know how long this will continue, but we do know that coverage of these issues did have an influence. So to conclude, racial resentment is an important driver of bias because it's based largely on whites' beliefs that blacks no longer face discrimination. And this is precisely what reinforces implicit bias. Still, despite the fact that we have this, this, this very different information environment, traditional media are still regarded as most credible um, among the public. And finally, as the Trayvon Martin case demonstrates, habits of mind can be changed of the stories that reflect hidden biases faced by African Americans. So thank you. Arlene, what do you have to say? I'm going to be practical, okay. <laughs> as usual. Thank you, Professor. We're a group of journalists, I hope. and. Um, Ultimately, it's about the journalism. And so regardless of what color and background is the staff, we really do have to be responsible for producing accurate and complete work on the topic of race, especially about black men and boys. Uh, I think journalism professionals really have to step back and examine their own biases, because until they do that, they won't recognize the prejudices that they're working with in terms of what they're leaving out of stories. I wish I could say that um, I thought 40-year-olds could change. I don't. I think once your mindset and, in fact, your unconscious racism is part of the way you think about things, it's pretty difficult to, um, to really set yourself up to examine that and to really face your, yourself in the mirror. So I really believe that we need to get into the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools, the colleges, and really um, work with students at all levels to talk about these prejudices and these biases. I agree that the Harvard test is really important. My students all take it. And they are, in fact, very surprised at what they find, including young black people in the classroom and, and their own prejudices and, and their own um, sort of stereotypes about who they think is positive and negative. Uh, but, you know, we can't let ourselves off the hook with all this because in the end, incomplete, inaccurate stories are devastating. Uh, and stories that perpet perpetuate stereotypes and actually uh, have done uh, disservice to this country. And I really believe that from the civil rights, the civil war on, we in the profession have shirked our responsibility to write accurately about the world we live in. 
and in fact, in many cases, were complicit in perpetuating those stereotypes. So I, I really do wonder how different the country would be today, how many lives would have been more productive and more fulfilling had the press in the late 1860s and even today are more willing to delve into the variety of perspectives and attitudes that permeate our society's behavior about race. Um, my plug for my book is Authentic Voice, uh, the best reporting on race and ethnicity. And let me tell you about how this book came about. It actually started here. Uh, Knight Ritter would then own the paper. And so how many owners ago was that? But when they owned the paper, they said that they wanted us to do diversity training. And so uh, they gave us this out of the box training program that had nothing to do with journalism. And so, those of you who know me, <laughs> I rebelled and said, uh, there was no way I was going to put this program on. And to test it out, I sent some of the white guys in, the, in, the, in our newsroom to the training, and they came back so enraged because this could have been about a box factory someplace. It had nothing to do with journalism. It had nothing to do with the stereotypes. It had nothing to do with community. And it really had nothing to do with examining the kind of work we were putting out there. So what I did uh, with the help of people like Dory Maynard and Walt Swanston, who was then a consultant for Knight Ritter, we put together a workshop that really got us to examine our work, to put it in front of us, to bring 15, 20 reporters and editors in the room together and really um, you know, tear ourselves apart. And what was, uh, I think, really very productive because in the end, most journalists felt that it was about how to improve journalism how to improve ourselves as storytellers. Not to be politically correct, because there are times when you really have to do tough stories about race, especially in this city, but that you do it in a way that's balanced and an accurate, and that you're bringing in all sorts of perspectives. So before I knew what I had a standing room audience for that workshop, for those workshops, and I brought it to Columbia and worked with Sig Gessler, who is now the Pulitzer uh, administrator, and we came up with this workshop called Let's Do It Better. And it wasn't for reporters, it was for editors and news directors. And they were invited to come and hear what we thought were examples of good work, not bad work, because what we found Sig and I found that every time we went to an American Society of Newspaper Editors meeting, you mentioned the word diversity, and the room emptied. I mean, people were scared to death, and, and we wanted to create an environment where editors and the so-called gatekeepers that make the decisions about what goes into the paper would not be scared that they would learn. Because after all, if you're a science reporting, you learn about science. If you're a medical reporter, you learn about medicine. Well, why can't you learn about race if you're gonna be a reporter uh, on the streets of this city and understand you know, what all the ethnic and racial issues are in a, in a community like Philadelphia? So uh, we put together this workshop and we started testing it on students and we, and we created a competition to look for really good stories, not flawless stories, but good stories. And we brought people in like Ted Koppel and um, Ed Bradley and very high level uh, reporters and editors to talk about how they did their stories and it worked. We brought editors in, and next thing I knew, next following years, uh, we were getting award-winning work from those editors. So we created the book because we thought it needed to go into classrooms. So it's a DVD with interviews from all the reporters and, um, and um, news producers who, are in the, who we thought really were doing top-level work. And now um, our next step, actually, and I think every university level should do this, our next step is to create a center on the coverage of race at, the, at, the, at Columbia. We have a $3 million pledge from somebody who is going to uh, underwrite a chair. And then we are, uh, I'm now campaigning for $10 million, actually, that will create fellowships for um, people who want to come to Columbia and do important projects on race, as well as uh, bring in some of the many assets at Columbia. There are many centers on race in this country, 
but they are not in journalism. They are in social science classes, they're in political science classes, they're everywhere, but they're not in journalism schools and they're not in journalism classrooms. And I think that's where we have to really um, campaign vigorously, uh, including, I think, at high school levels. And, uh, ASOL has been really in the forefront of putting that in uh, high schools and doing high school workshops here. But I, and I'm not saying just high schools where black kids are going to come in and learn, where I think that's really important. But I think all students need to learn these important lessons. You can't let them off the hook. We're all responsible for this kind of work. Um, in doing this book, I traveled all over the country and visited a lot of newsrooms, thinking, you know, I would learn something. And what I learned was that people really were unconscious about this stuff. In Houston, I found out that the marketing department of the newspaper knew quite well that um, African Americans considered Houston one of the best places to live. The newsroom didn't know it. They had never discussed anything with the marketing department. They didn't seem to understand their census. Here I was, a non-Houston person, going into the newsroom and telling them about it. I learned it from Essence Magazine because I was reading Essence. I was doing the homework that people in that newsroom should be doing. I went to Portland. Portland, there was an editor there who was very happy that she had diversified an education story. The education story was about how um, middle uh, test results, excuse me, test results in the middle school were uh, so bad. And so how did she illustrate it with a young black, picture of a young black girl? And I said, well, how many uh, blacks you got in Portland? Oh, maybe 2%. I said, so this is accurate. So you're using this young black kid to demonstrate that middle school test results are failing rather than a white student, which is actually much more representative of who's going to school in, in uh, I mean, Portland, not Houston. And so she was sort of shocked because she thought she was diversifying the story. Um, so uh, there are examples about like that over and over. Uh, two years ago, or last year, I was uh, doing diversity consulting at the uh, Atlantic City Press. Now, Atlantic City is not known to be a white city, that I can tell. And, uh, and, and they had this wonderful feature about mothers who were, and they were bloggers, they were bloggers, mother bloggers, and every single blogger was a white person. Every picture of the kids going back to school were white kids going back to school. Uh, what city are you covering? I mean, I, I really had to challenge the reporters and the photographers about this because they were sending out images that were, you know, incomplete. They may have, fine, you want to do part of, a, of Atlantic County is certainly uh, white, Margate, Longport, those areas, but the city of Atlantic City is not a white city, and yet they weren't being reflected in the paper at all. I hope uh, things have changed since, uh, since that discussion. But it is basically stepping back, doing a content audit of your newsroom, of your news pages, of your broadcast, and really taking a look at the images that you're projecting out there. Um, you know, if it's all crime, or if it's all sports, or if it's all entertainment, then you're missing some really wonderful stories. You could be doing a story about, you know, brides, and, you know, Diversify it. You can be doing a story about fashion. Diversify it. You could be doing a story about school. I mean, food in the city. Diversify it. There are so many ways in which we can uh, really uh, create different images than what we're seeing right now. So um, I think um, first thing is to really create a, a, an audit of yourself. Take a look at what you're doing. Second is to really create a checklist and for editors to challenge reporters about who are their sources, what, who are they bringing back. If you're going to do a story about, uh, about lead poisoning in a community, why not go and talk to a black physician or a Hispanic physician in that community rather than somebody at Penn? Because we keep going back to the old sources, the old sources, but we don't get down into the community. And yes, I know it takes a lot more time to do that, and we are all stretched right now. But in the end, it's all about the journalism, and it's all about accuracy. That's that. Thank you, Arlene.
Now, we're running a few moments behind schedule, but I do want to uh, provide you folks with an opportunity to ask a few questions, but we'll probably keep that section truncated a bit so we can then get into our working groups and get you out of here as close to on time as possible. So uh, do we have any questions from the audience? If not, I can ask the first one, or go ahead. Don't say we have a microphone. Uh, did, did you happen to go a lot of, did you happen to like study anything regarding sports? Because that's probably, given the definition, the operational definition that you've given, that's, I see that a lot in sports coverage, what you're talking about. Yeah, there's, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that um, sports reflects it because that's one of the few avenues of opportunity for uh, largely working class or lower class blacks. Um, the NBA, had a marketing campaign to sort of change this image based entirely on racial imagery. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I sort of open up my students to is I have them watch uh, Hoop Dreams, which is this documentary made in the in, uh, late 80s, I believe, in, in Chicago, where this, it kind of shows you the sort of paths that are available to uh, black kids in the inner city and how they're essentially scouted for their basketball skills, right? I mean, they have the city, the city is sort of, you know, there's a very efficient apparatus for sort of combing through the city and finding kids with basketball skills, who, by the way, also become excellent students who catch up to white students. Um, so I know I'm not answering your question quite the way that you asked it, but yeah, that's, that's, certainly, a, that's certainly a large part of the implicit attitudes come through uh, sports imagery, which tends to, you know, since it tends to violence um, and towards exactly the sorts of stereotypes that are sort of connected with, uh, with African Americans, I think sort of reinforces them. I have a quick question, and then we, let's bring it to her. What, what is the incentive for a news organization, especially in these times, in these challenges, all that's going on, all that there is to be concerned about. Why should a news organization rethink about how it frames communities of color? Because you can't afford to lose any eyeballs or any readers these days. It's about business as well as about being accurate. Um, I think if you continue to, in a city like Philadelphia, if you continue to only go after a certain demographic and you're ignoring another demographic, you're losing business. Mm -hmm. Comes right down to that. Okay. You got a question? I wonder, if any of your um, research or, or any of the research looks at the, the impact of biased attitudes on political coverage, and particularly coverage of um, black political elected officials. I mean, you think of the president most, most of all, but, but um, mayors, elected officials, council people. Yeah, there have been, there have been some studies done about that, and uh, the results are kind of mixed. Um, the, um, first of all, because there, are so, because there are so few black officials, they come under the microscope. Uh, and so whatever, whatever negative features they, they, they may exhibit in office, like for example, the former mayor of Washington, that became, you know, because there's so few to begin with, they, they become sort of stereotypically associated with a certain imagery. But I think subsequent research shows is that, uh, for example, mayors who are, who are re-elected then tend to be treated like any other mayor. So it's just when the it's just when the first example comes around that that example becomes much more carefully studied, but in subsequent terms, then suddenly the person's race doesn't seem to matter that much. Thank you. Next question. Arlene, hi, Linda Munich from uh, Six ABC, and I appreciate your comment about finding the expert who is uh, black. African American or Latino if you're doing a story and there are many out there and I want to suggest that I produce a show for 25 years where all the experts were of the ethnic group that we were paying attention to just ask the white guy who to give you a name and uh, when you find the expert ask him who he knows any other expertise it worked for me for 25 years 
interesting. I've, I watch a Today Show and watch who their experts are, and they have succeeded in diversifying their experts. I mean, it's really uh, gratifying to see it. Uh, I'm also seeing, I run something called the Punch Salzburger Executive Leadership Program at Columbia, and I am starting to see more people of color coming into that program, and a number of them are with their own startups their own websites. One person who's actually uh, an alum of this, of this newspaper, Glenn Birkins, was the deputy managing editor of the Charlotte Observer and resigned to start his own website called Q City News. And it's really targeted to blacks in Charlotte. And what he did was really smart, was that he started Q City Brides. This guy's making money. And so, so you're finding that people are taking different avenues to tell stories. And it wasn't that he thought that the Charlotte paper wasn't, you know, doing it, but he didn't feel that it was really reaching the community. And, and so he'll spend much more time on a story that impacts black community than, say, the Observer will. And it's having an impact. I was just wondering if, the, if, Professor, you did any research on the impact of commenters on websites, newspaper websites, invariably, not just philly.com, but every newspaper website I go on. And the story doesn't even have to be about race. They will inject it in there. And it just, the, the discourse gets reduced to really vile, yeah. racist comments, and they do it under the shield of anonymity with screen names, and so it really gives them the freedom to just spout off this vile stuff. And for most reporters, they'll continue to write what they're going to write. It doesn't stop you, but it does give you pause as a reporter when you write something racial. You just, you just think, oh my God, here we go. You know, I'm gonna have to, it's gonna be subjected to all these comments and the whole original story kind of gets lost in that stuff. So I was just wondering if you did any research that, um, that looks at those commenters as perpetuating racist stereotypes. I haven't. I mean, I've, I, I've observed them. I mean, I, uh, I look at the Chicago Tribune website, and uh, sometimes the, the editors turn off the comments on stories that have racial angles because, because the, the comments become so insulting uh, and horrific. They even, the Tribune even has, has mug shots that they put up, people that have been arrested, and they, and they tie them to news stories. And sometimes, and and they and they had comments for those, and they had to turn those off. Um, I've not done any systematic research on that, and it's really hard to know who these people are because there is a hardcore racist group that can't be reached, uh, and this is the opportunity for them to sort of leave the sorts of comments that that you see. I guess I'm wondering if. If you think that it's just really the hardcore racist, or do you think that it's your everyday Joe, that you know the everyday reader who, under the the luxury of anonymity, can say what he or she kind of really thinks? Yeah, that's a very good question. I I don't know the answer to that. Uh, trying to figure out who who these people are. Maybe it's you know it's the same core of people. You know I I don't know that, that these people are representative. Um, but I've seen, I've seen what you've pointed out, and maybe I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you influenced by the comments that are left by people? No. You are not. Well, 
I agree. I think you do wind up. So I think that that's one of the things that we've tried. We've seen with editors who come into these workshops that we do is there's then this self censorship because they're afraid to get into that mix. That's one of the things I would love to do uh, if somebody ever gets one of my fellowships to come in and really study that. What impact does that have on self censorship of the kinds of stories you're doing? Because you can see that there's this fear of getting into it and in getting into the mix and, and having to deal with it. We're going to have time for one more question, and then, uh, Mr. Scarborough, we'll take it from you, and then we're going to break into our groups, and you can have some more uh, vibrant conversation, and then there will be a report out. So one more question. Got you. So two things. One, um, the, uh, the point you made, Arlene, about some people being trigger shy about what they would actually write about, the most recent and the most egregious case of commenting going awry was uh, I don't know how many people know about this, the recent blockbuster, The Hunger Games, um, has a couple of characters, key characters from the book who were sympathetic characters who were of color in the movie. And there was a complete string of comments about how having black actors in key roles in their favorite book kind of ruined the movie. Um, and this was a string that went on forever. So the point being, race shows up no matter where you want to uh, you know, try and avoid race. And, and somewhere in there, there's some power, actually, not so much in you know, racists you know, queuing up their comments in the commenting stream, but you know, the niche press, especially online, um, you know, whether it's a news site that focuses on Hispanic news or black news or et cetera, um, you know, if you can create that same insulated forum where you feel like you are speaking within your group, that's, that's kind of the power of where media is going and why certain ethnic sites are doing better than some of their print counterparts because people feel like they're in a forum where they can actually have those conversations. So I don't know what the right answer is there, but, but the point I'm making, A, is that you can't protect yourself, and B, mm -hmm. sometimes some of that same debate or, or interchange is healthy as far as people consuming news. They feel mm -hmm. like they're actually in a conversation mm -hmm. and not being talked down to, which kind of brings me to my question, which is separate track, separate track, which is when you talk about um, Arlene in particular, and maybe some of your, your research too, Professor, um, trying to put the right faces on, in the paper, trying to put, use the right sources, I left the newspaper business, I'd say, 12 years ago. We were doing this stuff 15, 20 years ago. We yep. called it mainstreaming back then, where it's like throw out the ivory tower That's source, right. find somebody of color. Um, I actually worked for Gannett at the time that, for this example. We used to look at the whole paper every day and say, all right, do we have six white guys on the cover? Then let's change it out. Do we have six black people on the cover? Let's change it out, just so we had some, some bias. So the reason, that, what I want to ask you is, do you still find that people are resistant to having an open forum on their pages that they feel like, like all of us editors, we know everything and we're trained and our decisions are right. Um, I think, I think actually there has fatigue has set in. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the concern about just making it right now and, and figuring out where journalism is going has just become upper mind. And I do think this has the, the issues of diversity in the newsroom and in the, and in the content has sort of diminished as a, as a major thing. So. I've certainly seen it diminished within the, like the Gannett companies and, you know, there is no more Knight Ritter, but mm. I haven't seen anyone, uh, any of the major media companies really push it the way it was being pushed in the 80s and 90s. It's sort so, of fallen so. to the wayside. And I think that's the problem is that we just have to constantly keep it up. It's not something that you can reach this goal mm -hmm. and you've reached, I mean, we've reached plenty of goals at this newspaper and they've all disappeared, you know. Yeah. When I left here, it was probably 20, 25% of the staff was of color. I don't know what it is now, but I don't think that's it, right? And isn't, and, and isn't the question, I guess, and maybe for, for our whole couple hours that we're gonna spend here, isn't it really finding stuff that communities of color and maybe even young men in those communities actually want to read, as opposed to how they're represented in those pages? Um, because you could do a story about you know, a dental issue and use a black dentist from, from Temple, but you know, the issue of dental health or even caring about yourself or even you know, being interested in that story is lost on the people who you're trying to target or at least bring up. And, and so, you know, I feel like the question is, are we actually even putting anything in the, in the newspaper, online, on TV that actually caters to this audience that we're trying to covet? I mean, those of us- Well, I think that's why Glenn Birkins 
felt that Charlotte wasn't doing enough and started his own because he felt that, you know, he really, and that's why I think the Hispanic press television is so successful right now. I mean, the growth in this country is with the New American Media Association and its membership, and that's all ethnic press. Well, I think that's a perfect place to to break and begin to have our conversation. I want to thank our two speakers, Arlene Morgan and Professor Rojeki. Here is a small token of appreciation. Thank you. Some Amazon gift cards. Thank you. So you can get some more books. <laughs> no, or buy books. my book. Yeah, or, or, or buy Arlene's book, or buy your own book. Uh, I do want to quickly note that there is dessert and coffee that you could quickly grab, get a little sugar rush, and then we'll come back to have our conversation. We're going to uh, break into groups now. If the moderators would raise their hands, hi, I'm one. We've got Nia there. We have Mike Days and Dory Maynard. They're going to come. What we're going to do is sort of just sort of turn around. We had an idea for a more sort of uh, orderly, but I think since we're all family now, we'll just turn around, get together in some clusters here so we can have these conversations, okay? So uh, the, the moderators will group you together. I also want to point out that, um, so just sort of turn around and face each other so we know how to reach you uh, and your best way and so we can sort of figure out the best way to, for us all to, to, to connect. And there are going to be these three series of questions that you're going to be asked. Some of them are in different order. Uh, and then we're going to have a report out session at the end where I'm taking notes feverishly and returning to my, my reporter days. Take a picture of me. I, I, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna break that camera. Got my mountaintop camera. Did you see that? I do now. Yeah. That was a great play with Sam Jackson. It was on Broadway. Oh, did I see it with um, him and uh, Angela? Yeah, yeah. I missed it. I missed it. Wonderful, wonderful yeah. performance by. Well, that's okay. I'll copy it tomorrow. What are you doing? Yeah. I'll give it to you. Huh? What am I doing? Yes. She just videotaping folks. Oh, okay. She, she, she's you look like you had it aimed at, at, aimed at my chest. I was like, she's oh. wonderful. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I thought something was going to come to come, come out the. Uh, okay. chocolate all the way through? Uh, I'll take a risk. Are you shooting the <laughs> cookies? <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> You've got 60 seconds to get back to your seats. You know, Rose, I wrote today about um, the United Way and uh, the merger 
which we believe will be good for the region. And doing okay? Thank you so much. I'm so good. good. You got me eating. The chocolate on the teeth doesn't go me. You don't have it, but I'm just letting you know. Do you know about the police? Thank you all. Thank you, Mike Days, PABJ, and we will be in touch very soon. Take care and good night. Thoughts were. I am so glad that my colleague, Professor Turner, told me about it so that I could kind of um, get on Michael Day to invite me so that I could be a part. Um, for one, as a playwright and performance poet in the city, I, you know, my work act actively deals with the, the reframing or the rearticulation of the African American community. Uh, away from the stereotypes and the expectation of blackness. So to see that the journalists are really moving forward and kind of, kind of uh, uh, taking up the mantle again, I feel glad about because I was really mad at us for a long time for dropping the ball. Um, as a journalist uh, from many, many years ago, you know, I, I wondered what, what made us be quiet and not talk about the real issues in our community, not talk about institutional racism, not talk about the ways in which our young men and women are being uh, fed into the prison industrial complex by the institutional racism. And I know part of it is we, we've become comfortable in our middle class, um, but it's good to know that that comfort level hasn't stopped us from being concerned. And I'm, I'm very grateful to you for coming into Philadelphia and to hooking up with the Enquirer and, and finding ways of kind of bridging this gap. Because it's concerned me greatly and I hate to be the only one out here <laughs> making noise. And so now I know that there's a whole bunch of folks who are making noise too. I understand. Well, tell me your name. Kamika Williams Witherspoon. All right. Thank you, Ms. Witherspoon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Outstanding. Very well symphony done. Just noise. symphony. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. Can you state your name for the record, please? Arlene Morgan. I wanted to get your, thank you again for presenting today. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts uh, about tonight and what your takeaway. Do you think uh, uh, the journalists will see the light? Well, I think we've had some very good conversation. It's not a conversation that we haven't had 10, 15, 20 years ago, but we have to just continue the conversation, and I think some good ideas came out of at least the table where I was. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen some younger reporters here, mm -hmm. and I would have liked to have seen more whites here. So that's really the challenge, is so that is it, this isn't just Annette John Hall or Michael Days's issue, but this is the newsroom issue. Well, I think you're right. I think we had a few, and we got to keep. What would you? What would be your recommendation for how to get those constituencies here? And do you think that? I mean, as we alluded to, there's a sense of unconscious bias. People don't I even almost realize. think that we have to go into the newsroom and continue the conversation there, either by having uh, real conversations around stories and how those stories get done. I think if they're invested in improving their journalism and improving themselves as storytellers, they'll come to the table. Mm -hmm. If they think they're going to be preached at and talked to as if, you know, you know, they're uncaring journalists, that's not going to work. But it does have to be everybody's responsibility, it really does. So I think that's what you need to do is to bring the conversation to them. They're not going to come to you. And I think at that point, you need people like Michael Days and, and uh, Stan and Bill and the rest of them to have those kinds of, of meetings and discussions. And also, editors have to start throwing stories back and say, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. It comes 
comes right down to that. So we're going to have to journal with you. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you for your bye -bye. expertise. All right, state your name for the record, ma'am. Annette Town Hall. Oh, well, Annette, Ms. Hall. Uh, okay, is it? It's not hyphenated. Okay, Annette John Hall, I got yes. it. Yes. So tell me your reactions to this evening's conversation, uh, the information that you heard. Well, on the one hand, it was very promising that um, we thought it not robbery to talk about this again. On the other hand, it's sort of frustrating because I have been in on meetings where we've talked about diversity until we all turned a different shade. Um, and now it seems like we're with the cuts um, in staff and in newspapers uh, as a whole, it seems like we're back to square one. So that's disappointing. What, how did it feel in your, what was the conversation around your group? What did it center around and did you feel that it was productive? Well, we talked about how because there's such a lack of journalists of color in the newsroom that white journalists have to buy into mm -hmm. um, the success of the newsroom by covering diversity as well. Um, we have to, they have to understand that in order for, for the, the newspaper's success hinges on us having an obligation, I would even mm -hmm. argue a moral obligation, mm -hmm. to cover all communities, not just the ones that make sexy stories, mm -hmm. whether that's positive or negative. Do you feel that, did you feel that there was a sense of at least hope, optimism out of a conversation like this, or do you still feel that it's so insurmountable that... Uh... I think that the fact that we're bringing up diversity again and putting it on a burner, because it wasn't even on the back burner before, mm -hmm. it was just taken off completely. But now that we're putting it back on the burner is gives us reason to hope. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to look at creative ways to cover our communities of cover, color mm -hmm. differently, seeing as how we're not going to get the staff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that forces us to think outside the box and come up with some creative strategies to do so. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really difficult to come up with the language to tell a white reporter, I know you're well-intentioned when you forward your, me this story idea because it involves a black person, but maybe I'm not the one, that maybe you should do it yourself, think about doing it yourself. I think that we have to have hard and difficult conversations with our colleagues about why it matters that they should cover diverse stories on their beats. Mm -hmm. Those conversations, like I said, can be difficult to have. Um, anytime you talk about something racial, people interpret it as you accusing them as being racist. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're trying to tell the truth here and be accurate and tell stories as as well and as honestly as we can, and that requires having that conversation. So yes, to answer your question, I will be going back to my newsroom and having those conversations with my colleagues. Thank you very much for your time and for your comments. <laughs> You're welcome. Tell Oakland I said, huh? Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, state your name for the record. Neil Scarborough from hey, Comcast. Okay. Do I, got, do I got to do it again? Okay. So, I got to do it again? Okay. So, tell me what your reactions were uh, regarding tonight's events. Did you feel that some good discussion came out of it? And what were those points that you took away? Yeah, it was actually great to kind of come down here and meet with some other folks in the business, other folks from around the business, and really talk about a, a you know an issue that nobody's really solved, which is how we connected with the young African-American male. What are we doing for him? in the media uh, and what are we making relevant for them as far as content. I mean a lot of a lot of information that they could benefit from and it was really figured out how to package it and make it impactful so that these kids can kind of find a better way. It doesn't have to be the way we're all doing it, but they just gotta find a better way. Mm -hmm.
what are approaches that you feel could be applied? One of the thing, one of the questions today was what collaborations could be formed. Do you see Comcast being able to play a role with partners such as the Inquirer and other uh, media outlets from in this market? Well, absolutely. In fact, you know, your timing couldn't be better to ask that question because right now Comcast is, is under uh, taking a pilot program called Project Open Voice where the whole thought is that we're in six communities now and we want to, and we want to you know, help communities deliver you know, the political, the educational, the governmental, the services, the community information that you might associate with public access TV. So it's kind of like public access internet. We want information for the people, by the people. So maybe that's a start, you know, if we consider some of those people to be the, you know, the audience we're trying to target here, African American community, African American males, urban males, regardless of their ethnicity. Um, you know, Project Open Voice is, is at least a way that maybe Comcast can like shine a light on some more grassroots opportunities um, as opposed to mainstream opportunities to kind of get the communities elevated, learning about one another and sharing information. Well, we want to thank you for taking the time to come today. We really appreciate it. Yes, indeed. Well, thanks for putting this together. I mean, the Maynard Institute's always been kind of at the forefront of making us think about what we see and write and read. And so it only made sense to see Maynard Institute. Let's talk about content for the African-American male. You know it was going to be a very serious panel. You know we'd have some contributors, and it was really a good night. Thank you. Nicely done. No, you know. I'm, am I relaxed now? You're beautiful. Now? Okay, I was going to make sure relaxed. All right, give me your name for the record. Uh, Chris Murray. And you do? I am the vice president of print for the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. I am also a freelance sports writer at the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, and I have my own blog, The Chris Murray Report. Talk to me uh, a little bit about your impressions of uh, tonight's discussion. It was a very enlightened discussion, especially um, from you know the two professors that were on board, and, um, and in many respects, um, you know, I was telling Asel Moore that you know this is a conversation that we've had for over 20 or 30 years, but at the same time, we still need to have this conversation because, and we still need to keep putting it out there, you know, as you said bit by bit, bit by bit, and piece by piece, because um, we have to keep you know, fighting for the fact that there has to be diversity and balance in, in, in the coverage of uh, black males and also um, black people in general. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, the newspapers and the media outlets win because when you have diversity and balance, that means you have a whole set of new eyes you know, who are reading the papers, watching the coverage. And that's where at the bottom line, that's where fairness and balance you know, ultimately wins in the society so we can somehow bridge the gap of understanding. You know, granted, not all, not every story is geared to be positive because this is the news business. But at the same time, you know, there is a balance. There's always a balance. Mm -hmm. We have to follow that. Are you hopeful that this series of conversations can make at least some incremental impact? Of course I'm hopeful. I mean, you have to be hopeful because the thing is, you just can't sit back and say, well, this is a bad situation and not try to solve it. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, we have to basically solve the issues that we're dealing with. It may not happen maybe in this generation or the next generation, but we have to keep fighting. We have to keep bringing that, you know, bringing that battle forth and everything. Things don't happen in the day. You know, the civil rights movement happened over a period, even before King, going back to the you know, early 20th century century, of the, there, were, there were different battles. First it was the courts, then it was just the marches in the streets and things of that nature. So, and, and maybe there are, other, you know, there, there are other dimensions to this struggle, but we have to keep fighting it. You just can't sit back and say we've accomplished this when we have more things we have to accomplish. Outstanding. Thank you for taking the time. No problem. Thank you.